the same basic matter and style that we see in uh, Sappho and some other Greek writers of, uh, of that age, uh, particularly one, uh, Callimachus, uh, finds a new voice in, uh, in the Roman civilization in the form of a man named Catullus. Catullus was a, uh, a fairly wealthy, uh, politically connected individual um, in the time of the late Roman Republic. Uh, his father, uh, he grew up in Verona on a beautiful lake called Lake Garda, Lago Garda. Um, Supposedly a quite beautiful home. Uh, his father was uh, a friend or in some way knew uh, Julius Caesar, so that when Julius Caesar was passing through Verona at one point, they had him over for dinner. Uh, we hear this from a Roman historian named Suetonius sometime later, but you know, we don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of details about uh, Catullus in general, so we tend to latch on to that. That tells us that he was probably fairly well connected. He, uh, you know, had uh, had some prominence in society. He was not necessarily a uh, an old world aristocrat, but he had the money to move in those circles. Um, he. We think he was born around 84 to 87 BCE. Uh, we think he died about 30 years later. Um, again, we don't really know. Uh, all of that doesn't really matter because the biography is sometimes getting the way. It's handy to not have a firm idea sometimes about who an author is uh, or whether or not they were ever actually real people. Like, you know, Homer is an idea, not necessarily a human being. Sappho is probably just an idea more than a human being. Um, Catullus, uh, a human being, an individual, probably know so little about him, it's easy to put him aside. And that kind of fragmentary uh, record keeping, even in the Romans, who really like their record keeping, uh, it's, not all that, uh, it's not all that surprising. Lots of people walk around the earth, and we have no idea who the hell they are. Uh, Shakespeare was largely the same way. Uh, 1,600 years later, Shakespeare is born in the English countryside, and we have roughly, I don't know, half a dozen verified facts about his life in terms of records of it. We don't actually know when he was born, but we know when he was uh, baptized. So we just do a little basic math and say, well, okay, at the time, in that place, people were usually baptized about three days after they were born, so let's just say that's his birthday. That's the way record keeping tends to go in this. But the ideas of, or the, the facts of a life, the biography, does tend to get in the way. With Catullus, we have a fuller body of poems than we do with, uh, with Sappho, certainly. They are, uh, <clears throat> They were published in his lifetime. They were organized and edited for a long time afterwards. Uh, we have roughly 116 poems total from him. Um, the numbering can be a little weird because the numbering always goes to 116, even though they tend to skip over like 17 through 20 because Later, uh, later scholars decided that, well, those probably got slipped in by editors who, you know, it's 
it's kind of like to tell us his work, but we no longer think it was his. So let's just take those out. But the numbering remains. So, you know, roughly 116, i.e. roughly 112, let's say, or 113 poems. Uh, he was a, uh, or his poetry, let's say, is part of a tradition or an emerging movement, let's say, of the late Roman Republic called the Neoteric, or uh, Poetae Novi, the New Poets, uh, reacting against the traditions that had been handed down to them. Again, I'll point out that he probably died sometime around the age of 30. Uh, he is very much a young man throughout. Uh, and, you know, a little rebellious, uh, again, perhaps a little wealthy, perhaps a little arrogant, uh, possibly a little bit of a jerk every now and then. I don't want to get too personal on that. But uh, he wasn't going to take what other people told him too seriously. Poetry has to be this. Poetry has to be that. You should do this. It should say that. Uh, this is a proper an expected way to write, uh, and you should conform to that. Well, he wasn't necessarily going to do that. And he had some like-minded people with him in that. The tradition that they were largely acting against was the epic. Um, the kind of official line that is very of uh, broad, that is very public, that is not terribly personal or dealing with individuals, uh, that tends to put out a, a, or tries to put out an objective vision of the world that makes sense and that all individuals should look at and aspire to fit into. Catullus and his ilk, as we kind of saw with Sato, Sappho, was looking at it from the other end and saying, well, no, what's it like for the individual? And if you paint the picture of enough individual perspectives, maybe you can start to get an idea of the big picture from there. So it's a very different approach. Uh, also with that neoteric um, group, they, uh, they, they experimented stylistically. The, uh, the word choice, the diction, can be a little bit more artful. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the superficial aesthetics of it could be a little bit more um, uh, artificial or artful, the, uh, the meter, the literary illusions all suggest that a very sophisticated uh, and cultured readership. He was writing for a fairly narrow set of elite Romans, like himself, which is not all that unusual. There was no such thing as publishing in those days. Uh, you wrote for your friends. You wrote for people you knew. And you didn't necessarily care about getting onto the New York Times bestseller list. The money would be nice, but it wasn't really a thing. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that he wrote in a way that was particularly obscure. To this day, uh, his writing in Latin switching languages from Greek to Latin at this point, is fairly easy to pick your way through. Uh, beginner Latin students will often start by reading to tell us. Uh, it's fairly straightforward in its, uh, in its syntax, whereas Latin can be enormously complicated with some writers. Uh, Virgil was the uh, the figure that, is, is the figure that comes to mind from there. His 
poetry is uh, is very much in the epic tradition, but it's uh, much more difficult to translate. Generally speaking, if you're going to take Latin, let's say in high school, you can get to tell us after like two years. Uh, they're not your teacher isn't going to spring Latin or isn't going to spring Virgil on you until you're basically uh, graduating. Um, but very much like Sappho, he is also uh, focusing on different material than the epic. Uh, he leaves the uh, he he leaves the stories of wars and all of that to his younger semi-contemporary Virgil. Uh, Virgil was. I think like 15 years or so younger. I don't think they ever met. They may have crossed paths, but uh, Catullus, if he died at 30, he was probably long dead before um, Virgil would have come along. I honestly don't know. Uh, but he's writing about uh, love, very much in the same tradition as Sappho, whom he very consciously and explicitly copies. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes subtly, sometimes he's just doing a straight translation of her, basically. Uh, but she is obviously the lodestone for him. Uh, he, he takes it a little bit further also in carving out a specific uh, torturous relationship. With Sappho, we see she's falling in love with somebody, you know, anonymous, and then possibly the next week falling in love with an entirely different person who's completely anonymous. And just always, you know, in love, out of love, in love, out of love, this one, that one, blah, 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 blah. With Catullus, it's a little bit more sustained on a single figure. A figure, again, betraying his, uh, his allegiance to Sappho as a model. She, he calls this character, who may or may not have been an actual person, uh, Lesbia, i.e. someone from the island of Lesbos, like Sappho. So you can see that kind of explicitly there. And throughout his collection, and again, the arrangement of the poems, the order of the poems are numbered, but that's not necessarily a reflection of his saying this one first, that one second, blah, 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 blah. But throughout the collection, he references this same figure. And sometimes he is just head over the heels, blissfully in love, and other times, that bitch! And you see a back and forth throughout this collection. She, she's not in all of them. She pops up, sometimes she is named, sometimes she is not, but you get a sense of a sustained relationship being chronicled. Uh, and it's a turbulent one, let's say. Uh, in fairness, he does not seem like the easiest guy to have a relationship with. You know, uh, ladies, your girlfriends would warn you against him if you ever introduced them. But he maintains the same basic precept as Sappho in that the job of his poetry is to take you inside the experience of love, show you the uh, that kind of show you the effect of love on his own thoughts and feelings. And in a way, justify the uh, portrayal of love as a kind of, like we saw before, as a kind of battlefield. Saying, Homer's great, Virgil's great, he never read Virgil, but there's something else that is more interesting. There's something else that can be more dramatic 
is something else that can be even more harrowing. And let's talk about it. And it is the overwhelming, awe-inspiring, you know, uh, heart-trembling power of love. Um, he can be quite obscene. We'll get to his most notorious poem. But uh, he, uh, he is very, uh, he's very forthcoming in his passions, in his uh, appetites, in his uh, honesty, let's say, his ability and willingness to share. The, uh, the opening poem. To whom will I give this sophisticated, abrasively accomplished new collection? To you, Cornelius. You had the habit of making much of my poetic little when you, the first in Italy, were boldly unfolding all past ages in three volumes, a monument of scholarship and labor. And so it's yours. I hand this slim book over, such as it is, for the sake of its patron, may it survive a century or better. A little dedication. You know, you buy a book today, you flip usually the first page past the title page and all of the copyright information. You see a little, you know, to mom or for my dad or something like that. I'm kidding. Dads never get the shout out. I'm a dad. We're all dirty. Moms get him an awful lot. But... Here, he's singling out this guy, Cornelius. Now, Cornelius, you can read the little uh, footnote. He was an actual person. I don't care in the slightest. What I care about is what I can see in the poem. Now, when he is being built up, Cornelius seems to be a very important person. Historian. Author of uh, monumental scholarship. Three volumes. A big book. Cornelius is a big, important man. And by contrast, Catullus is just like, well, I got these little books. Little slim volume. Very, very small thing. Hmm. He also suggests that Cornelius is uh, a little bit of a dick who always pointed out, let's say, making much of my poetic little. Uh, well, we can glide over a not-so-subtle reference to size there and all of the implications that that might mean. But perhaps the three volumes of monumental scholarship of Cornelius is being set up as a little bit of a uh, uh, object of derision here. Because perhaps Cornelius wasn't the nicest to Catullus about his own poetic output. His output would be small. Cornelius's would be large. Catullus's output would be personal, whereas Cornelius is writing about history. It's the same dynamic as the epic and the lyric, the male and the female. Catullus is demanding the attention and subtly mocking the prioritization the fetishization of big books that are supposedly very important. I don't know about you, but I was curling up with a volume of Cornelius just the other night. I think he's being reissued, a uh, big splashy release, lots of press, he'll be on the Today Show. He's very, very popular these days, right? And that last line, 
for the sake of its patron, may it survive a century or better. The patron is Cornelius. The patron is the dedicatee. For the sake of its patron. Like, nobody's going to remember you. You wrote that big book, Monumental Effort. What was the word there? Monumental Scholarship and Labor. You worked so hard on that book. And I can tell already nobody's going to give a good goddamn about it. Just a couple generations from now, you are going to be forgotten. But me? My little book on more humble themes. Humble and Catullus are troubling notions to put together, but I'll do that. Uh, my little book will outlast yours. A little cheeky, a little cocky, a little uh, arrogant. Hmm. Number two, Sparrow! You darling pet of my beloved, which she caresses, presses to her body, or teases with the tip of one sly finger until you peck at it in tiny outrage. For there are times when my desired shining lady is moved to turn to you for comfort, to find, as I imagine, ease for ardor, solace, a little respite from her sorrow, if I could only play with you as she does and be relieved of my tormenting passion. He's writing a poem to a bird. Now again, you can't really take the ideas uh, of uh, order too seriously here, but this is the second poem in this volume. And it's about a bird, a pet bird. A little chirping something in the corner. And he seems quite jealous of that bird. And the relationship the bird has with his beloved. Already we're getting that idea of, okay, he's in love. He wants to be in on that. Uh, why can't I be with them? Why can't I be part of that? Just hanging out. And also that notion of, uh, if, if I could only play with you as she does, uh, a little suggestive there, and be relieved of my tormenting passion. The overwhelming power of love, the somewhat torturous um, practice of it. Experiencing love is a kind of suffering. Uh, it is also naturally frustrating. He can't do it. He wants to. He can't. I want to play with your bird. Desire, frustration. Crying, cry out, lamenting Venuses and Cupids and mortal men endowed with love's refinement. The sparrow of my lady lives no longer. The bird died. And he gives this kind of soaring requiem for a pet bird. Sparrow, the darling pet of my beloved, that was more precious to her than her eyes were. It was her little honey, and it knew her as well as any girl knows her own mother. It would not ever leave my lady's bosom, but leapt up fluttering from yon to hither, chirruping always only to its mistress. Again, he seems to want to be that bird in a really, really disturbing way. It now flits off on its way, goes gloom-laden down to where, where it is, there is no returning. Damn you, damned shade of Orcus that devour all mortal loveliness. For such a lovely sparrow it was you've stolen from my keeping. Oh, hideous deed! Oh, you poor little sparrow! It's your great fault that my lady goes weeping, reddening, ruining her eyes from sorrow. <laughs> it's a bird! Uh, 
a little hyperbole again, a little exaggeration, a little heightened emotion that makes it seem kind of stupid. Um, also notice, however, this sudden turnaround. With the caveat that the order is not necessarily guaranteed. But you have one poem that is a great celebration of this bird being alive, and then the very next poem, dead. That sudden reversal is kind of the point. That unexpected twist of fate that leaves you at a loss. Sudden catastrophe strikes. The vulnerability of all human beings to this sort of development. Again, that ancient perspective of not really understanding the world around you and feeling very vulnerable to its forces. Poem five, we get her name, Lesbia. Lesbia, let us live only for loving and let us value at a single penny all the loose flap of senile busybodies. Suns, when they set, are capable of rising, but at the setting of our own brief light, night is one sleep from which we never waken. Give me a thousand kisses, then a hundred, another thousand next, another hundred, a thousand without pause, and then a hundred, until when we have run up our thousands, we will cry, bankrupt, hiding our assets from ourselves and any who would harm us, knowing the volume of our trade in kisses. Ooh. Sexy stuff. Yeah. Uh, guy likes his kisses. He's very effusive about them, you would have to say. Um, it is a very young love. You know, oh, a thousand kisses, a thousand kisses, a thousand kisses, get, 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 get. He's very giddy about this in uh, in a way that I have to say the swept off his feet emotionalism of it again sort of rings a little uh, feminine to me you know this isn't a guy who's hanging out with his friends and saying yeah I, I met a girl she, she's okay this is oh kisses and kisses and kisses yay It's a very different voice for a dude. Uh, it's very fun, very vibrant, very physical. Again, that focus on all of the kisses, the thousands of kisses and the hundreds of kisses and the more than the hundreds and all of this. But again, uh, consider the vocabulary. Diction. What kind of diction do we have here? What kind of words are being tossed out here? What's the frame of reference in language itself? Carl, what's your major again? Remind me. Accounting. Accounting. Hmm. See any words that jump out at you here? What's that? Bankrupt? Yeah. Well, in my, the wording is different because of the very Okay. Yeah. We have asset here. We have an awful lot of numbers in general, thousands and hundreds and hundreds of thousands and yada, yada, yada. Uh, in that second line, value at a single penny, Farthing? Yeah, what the hell is a farthing? Uh, it's an old timey English coin, let's say. Uh, and even in the bottom, you know, uh, hide our assets from us and anyone who are knowing the volume of our trade in kisses. These are, these are distinctly economic terms, you know? Which is weird. Uh, you don't generally get that. I mean, for all of the, the fluttery emotionalism, 
going on here. He's talking about it like uh, he's looking at a balance sheet. Making an investment of some capital up front, expecting a steady rate of return at a certain percentage. Uh, you know, romantic stuff. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the way they phrase things matters. This is uh, not necessarily somebody who is entirely swept off their feet. They're, they're swept off their feet by the emotionalism of it, but they're thinking of it in very specific ways. They're thinking of it in terms of money. They're thinking of it in terms of loss and gain, um, of a kind of oppositional us and them as well. Always talking about um, uh, the perspective of others. Um, greed is sort of an undercurrent here. He is greedy for the kisses as a kind of income, as something to be paid. Uh, there is something in this that suggests a kind of uh, corruption of something perhaps pure and innocent. When you hear somebody talking about money all the time, uh, that's notable. Now, significantly, he is writing in the, uh, the waning days of the Roman Republic. And without my suggesting anything further about the history of Rome, when I say the waning days of something, what do you immediately assume about that society? Collapse. It's about to collapse. It's in trouble. Uh, I said before that Catullus was, through his father, uh, you know, uh, had a personal connection to Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar was out on his travels in war, Julius Caesar would eventually, of course, come back to Rome, declare himself emperor, get killed, and then his nephew would rise up to take his place, declare himself emperor, and there you have the Roman Empire, which lasted for another 250, 300 years, something like that. The Republic of Rome was a very different thing. But here you're seeing it in its late stages. You're seeing a kind of uh, corruption in society, perhaps. Too much concern for material, uh, material wealth at the expense of something genuine and heartfelt. And that creeping sense that greed is eating away everything that matters in society. But the emotionalism is in defiance of that. It's hard to really resolve those two because it's so emotional and so passionate and so over the top. And it's physicality. It's hard to connect that to that concern with money. And that essential uh, dynamic of keeping love primary and strong in a corrupting and hostile world is the thread you see running through pretty much all of his work. My lesbia, you ask how many kisses would be enough to satisfy, to sate me? Again, question of how many, how much? 
As many as the sand grains in the desert near Cyrene, where Silphium is gathered, between the shrine of Jupiter the sultry and the vulnerable sepulcher of Battus, as many as the stars in the tacit night that watch as furtive lovers lie embracing only to kiss you, with that many kisses would satisfy, could sate your mad catalysis. A sum to thwart and reckon this to thwart the reckoning of gossips and baffle the spell casting tongues of envy. You can see the, the word sum in there and the general uh, undercurrent of economic valuation. But at the same time, he seems to be overcoming that or trying to with the exuberance, with the emotionalism of it. And also notice how the uh, there is that slight, in that last line, that slight performative thing, we might call it, uh, to, to thwart the reckoning of gossips and baffle the spell-casting tongues of envy. Uh, everybody's watching. Everybody knows us. They're all gossiping about us behind our backs. This is a very public love that they are practicing here. And that's, uh, that's an interesting wrinkle to this. How subjective could this be if he is always trying to get outside his own head and consider everybody else looking at him and what's his reaction being looked at? All of this is going on. Number eight, wretched Catullus, you have to stop this nonsense. Admit that what you see has ended, it's over. Once there were days which shone for you with rare brightness when you would follow wherever your lady led you, the one we once loved as we will, know, well, as we will love no other. There was no end in those days to our pleasures when what you wished for was what she also wanted. Yes, there were days when which shone for you with mad brightness. Now she no longer wishes. You mustn't want it. You've got to stop chasing her now. Cut your losses, harden your heart, and hold out firmly against her. Goodbye now, lady. Catullus's heart is hardened. He will not look at you. He will not look to you nor call against your wishes. How you'll regret it when nobody comes calling. So much for you, bitch. Your life is all behind you. Now, who will come to see you thinking you lovely? Whom will you love now? And whom will you belong to? Whom will you kiss? And whose love's love lips will you nibble? But you, Catullus, you must hold out now, firmly. What's going on there? <laughs> A lot is an understatement, yes. What's that? A breakup? Yeah, possibly. Anybody else? What's going on? Convincing himself to forget her. What's that? He's convincing himself to forget He's convincing himself. He seems to be arguing with himself. You can see... What's that? He resents the... Yeah, he resents the hell out of this one. He's lashing out, clearly, from a place of resentment. But at the same time, I would say also, he's, he's backsliding a little bit. You can see it punctuated by these, uh, these moments of saying, you know, uh, you have to stop this nonsense. You know, you must hold out now firmly. He's addressing himself, I think is important. He's having a kind of internal monologue here. <laughs> Two minds, very good. But also, uh, like you say, he's trying to convince himself of something that perhaps he doesn't entirely feel up to. He wants to leave her alone, but he knows he's not going to. He's being really strong in his opinion right now. Perhaps, you know, but he knows that uh, later tonight, I'm going to be hitting her up. <laughs> you know, I'll 
I will denounce the bejesus out of her right now in front of all my friends, and then I'll be texting, texting her in around three hours. Hey, baby, what's going on? <laughs> you know I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, and it does get more intense as it goes on. He drops the word bitch in the last third of the poem as he's kind of going back and forth, and he keeps trying to get more and more aggressive, I think, because he's working himself up. We're seeing this from the inside of him getting worked up. And at the same time, he feels like, no, I've got, I'm, I'm starting to slide. Uh, I've got to get even more intense. The, uh, the constant urging to toughen up the uh, this sense that he is lashing out as a kind of emotional hysteria. Uh, again, this is all kind of uh, somewhat feminized. He's the girl in this relationship. I know that's very sex sexist to say. But in the standards of the time, where men are supposed to be in the Roman world, very stoic, very macho, men of few words, emotions always in control, he's giving voice to a very different side of the male identity. I was just going to say that um, it's like it comes off as like a narcissist. In a way, like the other one is like more in terms of like anxiety than He's like a narcissist because he's like going back and forth, like, should I forget her, whatever. And then yeah. people was like, F you, girl, who's gonna do, you know, take care of you the way I did or look at you the way that I do? You know, a lot of yeah. men <laughs> do that, so it's kind of that touched you with that same perspective from a feminine perspective. You know? Yeah, and it's like, all like, in his own mind, too. Right. So he's arguing not with her, but with his projection of her. And he's, he's just entirely caught up in that, which is classic narcissism. Yeah. He's not really considering her perspective at all. He's just trapped in his own, in the corner. I think it's more like, just really like, like, like he just feels really like, I agree that's a narcissist, but I think he also just feels really like, like, like he's trying to be so like, she, uh, to look out and find someone like me. Yeah. Or like, you're not, I'm too good for you. Uh, so he's like, kind of like, he's like, oh, like, she's not good for Yeah. This screams Kanye West as well. <laughs> yeah, there's some pretty heavy Kanye energy going on here. I got to admit, yeah. There's uh... a... <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't know because we're so trapped inside of his perspective. We... I would say we can assume that because he is so, you know, so caught up in it, but uh, it, it, we just don't know. And he doesn't know either because he is only seeing things from his perspective, and he can't break out of that perspective to take in anybody else's, you know? The, the, this is the flip side of the narrow view of lyricism, where they're trying to give great credit and value to an individual point of view. But how do you create any sense of context for that? You're focused so much on that individual point of view, you don't know what anybody else is saying. You know? If you were writing this as a scene between the two of them, all this is going on in his mind, the narration would be, and Catullus appeared somewhat agitated and pissed off. Lesbia was out shopping with her girlfriends. Not much to that. But by taking you inside, the poem is creating a kind of drama. Yes, this is in its way, a war poem. But it's about a man at war with himself. Number 11, Aurelius and Furious, true comrades. 
where Catullus penetrates to where in outermost India booms the Eastern Ocean's wonderful thunder, whether he stops with Arabs or Hircani, Parthian bowmen or nomadic Sagai, or goes to Egypt, which the Nile so richly dies overflowing. Even if he should scale the lofty Alps or summon to mind the mightiness of Caesar viewing the Gallic Rhine, the dreadful Britons at the world's far end. You're both prepared to share my adventures and others and any others which the gods may send me. Back to my girl then, carry her this bitter message, these spare words. May she have joy and profit from her coxmen. Go down embracing hundreds altogether, never with love, but without interruption, wringing their balls dry. Nor look to my affection as she used to, for it has left it broken, like a flower at the edge of a field after a plowshare brushes it passing. What's going on here? How's he taking the breakup? Not well. Not well. Reaches out to Aurelius and Furius, two uh, rival poets of his. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily call them friends, but yeah. No, that's what he said. Yeah, no, I know. And he's sort of doing this boasting thing. Yes, my adventures, I'm going to go to the four corners of the known earth. Uh, you know, name checking. Uh, the British Isles, which are the far extent of Roman territory at this point. Um, up into, uh, what is it, the Rhine which is sort of north, where you're getting into the, the German barbarians, um, you know, over into Asia. All of this is open to him. He is imagining himself this grand hero, traversing the world in glory. And he seems to be holding out to, you know, well, you know, you two can come along with me, but first you got to do me this one favor. You know, I'm going to give you this note, and you're going to slip it back to uh, to the X there. Kind of a cheap little hit and run on his part there. Um, I think the, uh, well, you can make what you want of that image uh, where she had joy and profit from her coxman, hundreds altogether. Yeah, that's exactly what he's calling her. Uh, now, you can take this from a couple of different perspectives. This could be, you know, he is basically imagining a, a very vicious gang rape. Uh, that's the dark end of what's going on here. So this kind of stalker behavior, and that's exactly what this is, has some, you know, warning signs in it. But again, what's really at play in the poem, I would say, is the state of mind, not necessarily any actions. I don't think this girl, whoever she is, if she exists at all, uh, is, is in any physical danger here. But this is all what's going on in his mind. And he's clearly a little agitated. Um, notice again. The way it kind of shifts mood right in the center. But how the beginning is all expansive and glorious and wonderful. And then in the end, it gets dark very fast. That abrupt change, that switch, is violent in its tone. Uh, again, sort of the the violence he sees in life, chaos he sees in life. It's one thing, and then suddenly very different. Things change immediately with no warning, and you're left kind of figuring out what the hell it is. Always in this, there is the sense of this relationship was just hunky-dory, sweetie pie, and then, bam, it's over. 
and he recalls the, the good times of the relationship. And that just makes the loss of it all the more bitter. So it's not just the fact that he's unhappy now because he's alone, but also because he can remember the good times and feels the violation of that sudden change that he just didn't see coming. The ending image, again, uh, she has left my affection broken like a flower at the edge of a field after the plowshare brushes it passing. Uh, plow. Think about a plow going through the earth in a farm. Interesting image. What does that suggest? A plow digging into the earth, spreading it apart, and pushing its way through. What's that? If you're thinking something dirty, no, I was just like, like, well, you should be thinking about it. Uh, <laughs> it is. That's what I, I honestly was thinking of, but I didn't. Have some okay. faith in your own dirty okay. mind. <laughs> I guarantee his is dirty. I know, but um, when I can say it's dirty, it's uh, life, you know. Like yeah. Made, so it's sex. Yeah. Right. Okay. The plow and the flower. Oh, really? okay. That's very sexualized. It's you know. Yes, it's an image of violence, and we'll get there too. But it is also undeniably a sexualized image. But let me ask you this: Who's the flower and who's the plow? He's the flower. He's the flower. The girl is the plow. Mm. That shift is subtle, but it's there. He is, as we have seen slightly throughout, and he gets more so, playing with some ideas of masculinity, playing with some ideas of gender roles, of conventional roles. He is the woman in that symbolism. Uh, he is always the victim. He is the one overwhelmed by love. He is assuming all of these classically feminized traits in stark opposition to the tradition of epic poetry, which has macho guys doing macho things, because that's what macho guys do when they do things, which have to be macho. <laughs> He is saying that, well, that's not always the case. And it doesn't have to be the case. So he's opening up that little area for people to admit that, well, okay, yeah, sometimes I feel like the flower. So he's kind of channeling Sappho? A little bit, yeah. Sappho was the great poetess of, uh, of, of gender norms and, and questioning those spaces spaces between conventional sexual roles and he is doing exactly the same thing now of course we have to go from there straight on to oh, <laughs> 16 oh, I'm not gonna read that out loud okay. because I don't want to have to get some complaints and have to go sit through an HR thing <laughs> yeah I'm sure nobody here would Call me out on this, but it would be an anonymous person passing by and say, you would not believe what I heard today. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, let's say, visceral in what he wants to do to his two colleagues, uh, Aurelius and Furious. Uh, again, I'm not going to get too specific there. The, uh, the translation of it... Uh, can be really fun to go from translation to translation to see how inventive they can be in terms of who's doing what to whom. I don't want you to read that out loud anymore, and I want to read it out loud either. Of course. No, I think this is a sort of clean version. <laughs> <laughs> we 
don't need to go into the specifics. <laughs> but let's look just a little bit down here. Uh, he objects to Aurelius and Furious for their way they are reading his poetry. Uh, Aurelius and Furious, who read my verses but misread their author. You think I'm effeminate since they are. Purity is proper in the godly poet, but it's unnecessary in his verses, which really should be saucy and seductive, even salacious in a girlish manner, and capable of generating passion not just in boys, but in old men who've noticed... All right, I'm not going any further with that. But! What the hell is that little middle passage? You can read through like four or five lines there without getting uh, to the dirty parts. What's really irritating him that sparked this uh, this uh, tirade, you know, about sexual violence? What's bugging him? Not what's buggering him. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that one. Uh... What's gotten under his skin? He's not, he's, he's not taking seriously for what? From the other poets, like they think he's uh, so, They think yeah. he's effeminate based on what? The poems that he's writing. The poems. Mine says. Uh, who dare judge me on the basis of my verse? They dare manly. They may be manly. Does that make me indecent? Yeah. Wait, I have a question. Shoot. Who's the godly poet? It's a period that you've been standing out. Uh, that's sort of a. Uh, they have a poet back to No, I think that is. Uh, they're saying, you know, a poet who's writing about pious things or something like that. A godly poet, one who is writing about uh, something quite uh, proper and pious and all of those things. And there it is appropriate for um, purity in the poet. He is not setting himself up as the godly poet. I think we can all agree on that. So he doesn't feel any obligation to be pure necessarily, to be moral. But more than that, it's unnecessary in his verses. It doesn't matter how moral a poet may or may not be because uh, the person is irrelevant, which is what I say all the time. The character of the author is uh, in the realm of who gives a good goddamn. All that matters, according to Catullus and me, so wake up Sorry. are what the poems say, what they do, what the words on the page do. And the words on the page can be a mask, can be an absolute lie, but it, if they can have create an effect in you, then that's all they have to do. You can't read this and say, well, I know everything there is about Catullus. He wrote about all this. Obviously, he wants his girlfriend to get gang raped, and he wants to sexually assault his two rivals, Aurelius and Furious. That is clearly, that's what he's saying. Your Honor, it's right there, black and white, on the page, case closed. No. He is pointing out that a poet, an artist, has the ability to just say, I'm pretending now. This is make-believe. And I can do whatever I want on the page and have it stay on the page. And it's no reflection on me. Because my character will just contaminate what that can be. That, the poetry, the art, can be anything and is more likely to be anything if you're not 
pinched in on all sides by some assumptions about what I am as an individual artist. Forget about the artist, it's the art that matters. You had a comment. Oh, um, two comments. But, um, I don't know if it's it seems like it's just a literary form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, I don't think, well, okay, pornography, and we can go there. Uh, I mean, not that we're going to go watch pornography. Like middle finger to them. <laughs> It is. On the one hand, it is, uh, again, calling into question all the moral uprightness of the epic tradition that is so concerned with transmitting proper values onto the young. Uh, and this is Catullus and his fellow neoterics saying to that, uh, we're here to do something a little bit more personal. Human beings are more complex than just, you know, what we're told in Sunday school sermons. Yes. Uh, and all of that needs to be appreciated in order to understand human beings in the slightest. So he's doing that. He's also, I think, uh, showing again the intensity of emotion. I don't think he really wants to sexually assault these two. He might. Maybe they're really good looking. But regardless, <laughs> he's lashing out. He feels offended by something, just like he was offended by his girlfriend dumping him, and he is lashing out emotionally. And that emotion is carrying him on to some pretty extreme statements. I don't know about you, but from time to time, I have said the wrong thing in the heat of an emotional argument. Never quite that, but you know. Uh, I have been impolitic in my language, and perhaps a little too forceful. And he is saying that, well, yeah, we, we all can be. But then those on the outside, or like the leaders, I guess, they're. I don't know if they don't want to, but. They're, they seem incapable like of separating the two. Who? The author and the writing. Yeah. yeah. It's a challenge. Yeah. But it's something that has to be brought in mind. In order for art to grow beyond, um, you know, simple morals and. Uh, George Washington chopped down a cherry tree, and that's why I cannot tell a lie. In order to move beyond that, art needs to be free. And we need to be able to um, not be so concerned with where it came from, but just follow along the implications that we see on the page. Because, you know, again, we don't know anything about Catullus. He might have been, you know, a very moral person. The fact that he is dealing over and over again with these questions of outrageous behavior suggests to me that he does have a moral code in there. And that he is pointing out the breaking of those moral codes in a kind of ironic way. And suggesting that, well, you know, this is what can happen. But you know, uh, there is a long tradition um, of art that provokes through being outrageous. And it's not necessarily always what we call pornographic. Pornography, and it's a really troubling definition, that even the Supreme Court shied away from in a very famous way. But uh, it is generally just about stimulating sensation and nothing beyond that. 
This, I would say, has something beyond that. It has a second beat to it. It forces the sensation and then asks you to sort of consider the sensation. The outrageousness of his behavior, the outrageousness of his language, of what he's saying he wants to happen or that he will do, automatically makes us sort of recoil. Like, well, I don't want I've been mad before. I would never do that. So we are forced to objectify his perspective. We're forced to reflect on it and say, well, okay, I have been mad before, but he's getting carried away. And what's the difference between them? Notice also his refrain of thousands of kisses. these little callbacks that he places throughout in this long series of poems. Um, uh, uh, uh. 51. Here is, in one way translating and another shamelessly ripping off, his idol, Sappho. Sappho's 31 plus 500 years becomes 51. To me, that man seems like a god in heaven. Seems, may I say it, greater than all gods are, who sits by you and without interruption watches you, listens to your light laughter, which casts such confusion onto my senses lesbia, that when I gaze at you merely, all my well-chosen words are forgotten as my tongue thickens and a subtle fire runs through my body, while my ears are deafened by their own ringing and at once my eyes are covered in darkness. Leisure, Catullus, more than just a nuisance, leisure, you riot over much enthusing, fabulous cities and their sometime king have died of such leisure. Obviously, the same kind of situation. He is sitting somewhere and watching his beloved. Here, it's a specific lesbia with Sappho is just the latest. And she is being charmed by another really good looking guy like a god. Now, significantly, here, Catullus is a man viewing this scene, whereas with Sappho is a woman. So when the guy says that the other guy looks like a god in heaven, that's a little fruity. What's going on there? So there's a little note struck there. More gender norm, fluid sexuality suggested. Uh, more sense of after the breakup. He remembers the joy of when they were together, and this is just twisting the knife again. The experience of that loss is made more acute by remembering the past. That great line, a subtle fire runs through my body. Almost an exact translation of Sappho. Again, after that, checking off the, uh, the ears and the eyes. And then that final stanza. Um, leisure, Catullus, more than just a nuisance, leisure. You riot over much enthusiasm. Fabulous cities and their sometime kings have died of such leisure. Uh, when he's sitting there staring at these two, uh, he's not doing anything else. Maybe he's got a little too much time on his hands. Maybe he is in this moment objectifying himself. He's having this little 
internal monologue once again. And thinking about his own behavior, his own thoughts, and saying, hey, that's not very productive. Um, the long one is poem 64. This is the longest poem in his collection. It is uh, known as an epilion, which means little epic. And it is a curious story in the, uh, the sort of epic narrative tradition. There's not necessarily narrative going on with most of his short lyrics. Lyrics tend not to be narrative. Uh, but here he's giving, uh, giving some narrative. And it's a, a kind of a bizarre one, and it's hard to follow at times, where it's, st it, well, it's name-checking an awful lot of uh, uh, Greek and Roman uh, myth. Um, and you're kind of expected to know these things. It's just, you know, the culture. Uh, you're just aware of them, basically. And But he is writing for a, uh, again, a fairly elite audience of, uh, of educated gentlemen like himself, mostly. So they would automatically get all the references. But it's okay to be a little lost by them. And I would say that a purpose of this poem is to get you a little lost too. The poem starts out with uh, a little reference, allusion, whatever you want to call it, to Jason and the Argonauts, a famous Greek myth about a uh, one of the first, in here they allege that it was the first, uh, uh, sailing ships. And Jason builds this grand ship to go and sail across the sea. Here, the Mediterranean Sea, not even so much. They're going through the Eastern Mediterranean into the Black Sea uh, to retrieve uh, the Golden Fleece legend. You don't need to know all of that. So they start there. And then they end up or twist itself into one of the sailors. It's not going to, it turns out it's not going to be a story of Jason and his myth at all. It's going to focus on one of the, one of the sailors on his uh, trip, um, Peleus, who just happens to be, for those of us who remember the opening lines of the Iliad, he's Achilles' dad. Uh, so now we're suddenly in that story. But it's not about what's interesting about him being Achilles' dad. It's about, well, he was on this trip and he looked over the side of the boat and he saw a, uh, a water goddess, a water nymph, over the side and he fell immediately in love. And this is Thetis, the mother of Achilles. And so we are set up with this story of uh, the, the love story of Achilles' parents. Like, okay, fine. Again, we have a great war story that suddenly this poet is saying, yeah, 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 yada, yada, the war, let's talk about a wedding. Reappropriating the same basic material into a new, more uh, feminized con uh, uh, context. Uh, and, and, but even that, you get that, and then it sort of dwells into the arrangement of the, or the, uh, the setting of their wedding, and we are told about a, uh, a bedspread for the bridal bed. And on it is embroidered a, uh, an image out of, uh, more out of mythology. The story of Theseus and Ariadne. So then suddenly you're into that myth, and you're going, oh, okay, now we're, we'll just follow along with that. And this is a story of abandonment and uh, deception 
and uh, romance uh, gone wrong that ends in tragedy. And this is all embroidered on the marriage bed of these two. And we spend a long stretch, like 200 lines, talking about this myth of Ariadne and the tragedy. And then we're back out of that, and, we're, and suddenly we're at the wedding again, and the Furies come in, and other more figures from the, uh, the, the Greek pantheon of gods. The Furies come in, and they have this long uh, toast, if you will, about the wedding. And it's, uh, it's kind of a harrowing tale in its own. One thing after the other after the other. It's all deliberately confusing. You're meant to get luck. Now, at the heart of this is that bedspread, which tells the story of Theseus and Ariadne, who very famously, Theseus was, uh, went into a maze to kill a monster called the Minotaur, who had been terrorizing people and yada, yada, yada. And Ariadne betrayed her own father, the king, by helping this guy, this hero. The king had expected, okay, you're going to go into the maze, and the minotaur, who's my son, is going to go and kill you uh, and eat you, and that'll be good for him. Uh, but instead, Ariadne gives him a sword to defend himself and kill the minotaur, and also, very importantly, a thread to lead into the maze and then to follow back out. She allows him to get into the labyrinth and negotiate her way. And this whole poem is that labyrinth. This whole poem is full of little blind alleys and wrong turns and sudden surprises, and you're confused the whole time. You can be reading this and be like, what, 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 what? Trust your instincts in these moments. If you are confused, that's intentional. Catullus is a very good writer. He knows how to keep you unconfused. Again, go back to his friends Aurelius and Furious. He knows how to say something very clearly. But by leading you along in a very oblique and murky way, he's doing something very different. Um, in all of this, there is another theme of uh, in all of this poem, there's another example of the theme of uh, uh, foreboding, of an uncertain future, of a dangerous nostalgia for the past, and the sudden changes that can happen along the way. Uh, Ariadne was promised by Theseus that he would marry her and take her away because she did just betray her father and brother, and things don't look good for her at home. So, okay, you're, you're going to marry me, you're going to take me away, and, and we're going to live happily ever after, right? Said, yeah, 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 sure. She gets on his boat, they sail to a, another island. The next morning, she wakes up. Out the window, she can see his boat sailing off into the distance. Abandoned. Like that. From great joy to sudden catastrophe, sudden misery. That same shift that we have seen. Uh, that is on the wedding bed of this new couple. This new couple who 
will give birth to Achilles. And you can say, well, you know, Achilles, he's a great hero. So, you know, that's going to go well. But the story itself that they tell of Achilles in this, again, reframing it away from the war, is just what a uh, bloodthirsty guy he was in general, how violent he was, and how distasteful he was. So this simple little joy of falling in love, looking over the, looking over the side, Peleus the human, looking over the side of his boat and seeing this nymph-like goddess in the water and being transported, overwhelmed by passion and love, and suddenly you look down the road and everything goes to hell. Again and again and again, these same themes crop up. I want to look just a couple towards the end. Um, maybe just the one. Number 85. Again, one of his most famous. Uh, Odi et amo quare et facium fortasse requiaris requiris nescio sed fieri sentio et excrucior. Pardon my Latin pronunciation. It's kind of chunky. Uh, this is another like favorite standard of Latin classes because it is so short. But in the translation we have before us, I hate and love. And you should ask how I can do both. I could, and if you should ask how I can do both, I couldn't say. But I feel it, and it shivers me. There's a lot going on there. Uh, I hate and love. Well, I think we've seen that. They're both powerful emotions, and he is susceptible to them. Uh, you could say that he is more uh, in tune with the emotions in general than the individual emotions themselves. Sometimes hate and love seem pretty indistinguishable to him. Uh, and their tight statement at the beginning especially in the Latin, odi et amo, suggests that they're kind of the same thing. And if you should ask how I can do both, I couldn't say. He's admitting, uh, I, I don't know, there's something inarticulate there. There's something beyond the power of my reason. Reasonableness is such a uh, grand epic value such a conservative value that it has no place with Catullus and his emotions. All that matters, however, he doesn't care about the reason. All that matters is that he can feel it. All that matters is the sensation, the pure emotionalism of it, the overwhelming quality of it. The emotion itself is all that matters. It is achingly human in its vulnerability. He is absolutely at a loss, powerless to stand up against it. But he's struggling to, even though he can't and never will. But I feel it, and it shivers me. I love that word, shivers, too. Um, the, the original excrucior uh, generally means something more like, well, you, you can see the uh, excrucior, so like excruciating, that kind of physical suffering that almost nervous system jangling sense. It's also connected to the word that'll take on new meaning in a 
few generations of uh, Roman history, uh, the word crucified. Same basic etymological path there. But look also, I hate and love, and if you should ask how I can do both, I couldn't say, but I feel it, and it shivers me. Uh, more narcissism. More self-involvement. That's all he's offering here. Now, it's very powerful. And again, if you were to look at this, you would just see somebody who's kind of a, you know, nervous guy, and like, you know, kind of twitchy. Like, all right, I don't get it. Objectively, it's not all that interesting. We've all got a friend who just, you know, is always going on about something. But here, we're taking on the inside. We're taking into that mentality, into that psychology, and shown. This is how this person sees the world. And it's not necessarily the way that everybody else does. It's certainly not the way that I see it. But that voice is validated because it's in print. Well, if I see, see things a little different, maybe I can do the same. But I'm not big and important like the epic tradition. Well. That doesn't necessarily matter. All you have to do is focus on the emotional experience of the individual in context of the world around them. And then, and you can see this throughout his work, you can see that the act of the act of poetry itself, of loving itself in the face of great hostility is a kind of act of faith. You can see this in a lot of these poems, where he is, he knows that his feelings will not be uh, reciprocated, will not be validated in a lot of ways, but he persists in them. And there is a kind of honoring dignity in that. In, La, in Poem 101, at the very end, he's sitting there and confronting his brother's grave. And he bemoans the fact that he has to, quote, speak in vain to your unspeaking ashes. And then at the end, he has to accept these presents, wet with my brotherly tears, and now and forever my brother, hail and farewell. His words are something he is offering that he does not expect to be of any value. He's talking to a grave site. He doesn't necessarily believe in an afterlife or anything like that. But by producing words, by producing language, by cataloging his emotions themselves, he is offering them up, expecting hostility, expecting to be perhaps ridiculed. But there is a kind of uh, active self-sacrifice in doing this, a kind of bravery and piety and value in the emotionalism itself. I know no one values this kind of uh, emotional intensity, but I'm going to do it nonetheless. Because that's my own sense of integrity, my own sense of honor. In a lot of ways, Catullus speaks in a language of will. He will will his language into validity, even though it is being attacked on all sides. He wills his individual emotional state into validity, even though he sees it outnumbered, outgunned, overwhelmed. He has his own moral code.
and there is a certain uh, dignity in pursuing it against 